I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community? Peace, happy family, and welcome to another exciting edition of Happy Talks. I'm your host tonight, Taki Grant, and we have a very exciting, informative program this evening. Uh, we have two giants in the community, Infodishi Jehutimes and Dr. Georgina Falu, talking about a subject that's very near and dear to Hopi, that is culture and money equals power. When we, fit, when we say very near and dear to Hopi, when you think of the Hopi movement and everything that Hopi stands on, the understanding of how we take our culture and marry it with our economics. Um, as Dr. Jeffries so poetically calls it, the pyramid analysis, economics, politics, and culture. Economics, politics, and culture have an understanding or a mastering of all three is the pathway for our empowerment. So when we think about the happy movement and understanding how to just merge these things, um, you understand how we, what this movement is all about. So as we go back to the production of, of Hoppy and, and some of the things that were said in the film. Um, by the way, for those who don't have a copy, definitely should take this opportunity to go ahead and get you a copy of Hoppy, the one with the documentary Hoppy. Um, with, with that being said, Dr. Julian Malvo says in Hoppy that oftentimes economics to Black people are like the children looking in the window at a at candy at a candy store. It's there, but it's different to us. It's distant from us. And she also stated, and further stated that it's been taught of black people have accepted the notion that we have not been, we we're not economic actors. Where we do the what they call the microeconomics of paying our bills, going to work, things like that. But the more macroeconomics, the larger scale seems to be very distant from us. So we're here at Happy to let everyone know that economics is something that's always been very near and dear to us. When we think of the world's first great mega economy, Kemet, you think of, you think of Africans that lived alone and now, and those who have set the way of economics by mastering the ecology. But we're going to get into that later in the discussion with our two great giants that we have on the panel tonight. Um, for those who don't know, um, we are going to Kemet in February. Um, this discussion here is a precursor to that. The dates of February 16th to the 25th, and it's Discover the Origins of Economics in Egypt with Hopi. It's very important to understand that because this journey is not just going to be a journey where we're going to be learning about the history, but we're also going to be learning about economics and how to merge the two. So critically important. The balance is essential for what we need to be doing. And again, we'll get into that later as we move on in the discussion. Um, also, family, we have a uh, a happy clearance sale on all the merchandise. Everything has been marked down to make the way for new inventory. Um, definitely want to take this opportunity to go check out the, the happyfilm.com um, store, the merchandise tab, to take a look at the merchandise we have and see um, what everything's kind of marked down. Some stuff has been knocked down that actually have price. Also, family, we're going to be in Atlanta um, showing a very uh, special screening of happy in conjunction with the National Business League's um, conference in Atlanta. For those in the Atlanta area, those who are not in Atlanta area, definitely want to take this opportunity to go to their website and get your tickets and be a part of this experience. It's going to be dynamic and happy is going to be there in the building alongside the National Business League and the president, Dr. Kenneth Harris. So family, with the, without any further ado, we're going to bring in our guests. We're going to get this show started. Emotep, my brother Infodichi Chihutimes. Emotep, Unk Uja Seneb Neb, Dua Necha. Greetings, Dr. Falou. Nice to have you back. It's been some time since you've been here, Dr. Falou. It's always good to see you. Yes, yes, yes. You you know, for those who don't know, have seen the film, Dr. Falou is one of our resident scholars 
an economist. Um, she was in the Happy Film. She also had been with us on our, 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 um, our events, the um, One Africa Power and Unity Conference in Detroit, and also the Happy Day of Black Excellence this February. Dynamic job, all occasions, phenomenal speaker, um, a wizard when it comes to economics and looking forward to helping people in their journey, in the economic journey. So, so we, we talk about how they save money in consciousness a lot of times. And it seems like people oftentimes kind of choose one or the other. Why is that? Why do we struggle so much to have a balance? Well, first of all, we're not operating in our cultural paradigm. We're operating in somebody else's cultural paradigm who have relegated us to a second class citizenship and, de and deny us some of the access that they normally have and take for granted. See, white people will say, oh, I don't have no white privilege. No, yes, you do. If you walk in the bank, you got privilege. I walk in the bank, especially if I walk in with a mask, I don't know if I'm going to rob the place or not. Okay, so there's an attitude difference, and it's based upon culture. Culture is your medicine. Because we're outside of our culture paradigm, we don't know that our culture heals us. So our economics should be built into that to help heal us. So here's a perfect example. We have a multitude of black millionaires in the entertainment industry. That money filter into the black community. We buy the albums, we buy the tapes, we buy the CDs, we download it. But does that money come back into the community? No, it goes into new cars, $10,000 worth of jewelry at one time, uh, a gown that costs a million dollars so that you can walk the runway. Uh, uh, Beyonce and them just bought a house that was 300000 no, three hundred. $300 million. There's a, a, a housing development across from me that has 176 units. It has a multitude of stores on the bottom with a mall adjoined to it, and it costs $125 million. Beyonce's house costs more than this house that has 176 units and a mall with Target, a whole, a whole bunch of stores in it. You see, so we got money. But because there's no cultural connection, the money doesn't filter back into the community. Mm. And so <laughs> you can see the disconnect. Look at our basketball players. You know, 30 million, 50 million, 100 million. <laughs> but that money doesn't come back. LeBron probably is one of the only examples of uh, an athlete outside of like Magic Johnson. You know, but again, it's not the black community. He just tapped into an economic reservoir. Okay. He's using his blackness and his ability to be dynamic to make money, but it's not making money for black people. <laughs> okay. But uh, look at Jordan. <laughs> Jordan's franchise is more than all the NBA together. But does that trickle down into the black community? No, there's a cultural disconnect. Jordan. It's always seen in a beautiful European suit, custom tailored, shoes shining, you know, and now he's married to a European woman. I mean, you know, the whole thing. So that money does not trickle back into the black community. Black uh, ba basketball players, none of that money. And let me just say this, even though LeBron has a school and the school automatically, if you graduate, it goes into a European college. And I must say European college because I know it's in America, but it's a European cultural paradigm that's going to imprison you. Okay, so I need to say that. So, yes, so it looks like LeBron is doing something really good. It's got some black faces on the wall, but it's still a European curriculum. I looked at it myself to make sure that I wouldn't be saying something that's not. It's not a Euro, it's not an African centric curriculum. So, they got the same curriculum almost that the white folks got on the other side of town. And then they're getting funneled not into a HBS school, not into a black school, but into the, the local European school. So naturally, the European this is plus for them. This is positive for Europeans. They want this. Oh yeah, fundle your best 
into our institutions. So guess what? They get, the Europeans get their best and they get our best to work their program. So when they get their degree in economics, it's not to open up business in the black community. When they get their teacher's degree, it's not to have an Afrocentric school. It's to get a job in the matrix. And so unfortunately, even one or two of our um, giants who do something economically, and it's only one or two, it's a very small, when you look at the NBA is 90 something percent black. Look how much money that is that's going into the community. They could be going into the community. You open up every program with Dr. James Small talking about how much we would be the 16th wealthiest nation on the planet. But culture is missing. All of those other people have their culture first. Then their economics feeds on that and their money is circulated within a cultural paradigm. Hmm. Even so, our billionaires, that money filters straight out. They running straight to the European jewelry store. They going to get some diamonds. They go, they gotta have Gucci. They gotta have a European designer. They got you see that money goes straight out of the community. Hmm. Culture is your medicine. So the money needs to circulate within the community or within African people. Uh, I have this formula, Saki, but I know you want to say something. Let me just say this here. I have a formula. The formula is if you do something dynamic, first, you should be able to benefit from it. That's self. Second, your family. Third, your people. Fourth, your community. And then it goes into the world. We invent something, we get paid, and it goes straight to the world. <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't enhance your family. He, Garrett Morgan created the traffic light. He sold it to General Electric for fifty thousand one time. None of that money went to his family. Black people don't benefit from it. It went straight to the world. General Electric spread it off into over a thousand multi million dollar countries all over the world. Black people don't benefit from it. So if he had my formula, M for DC Jehuti Muslim's formula, okay, he would have got paid his fifty thousand. Then he would have said, "Listen, I want some of my family members. They're pretty good at this. I want them to be uh, business people to op to help open up franchise and be part of the General Electric company, and that's part of the deal." And everybody said, "Okay, all right, because we want the invention. No part, no problem." Now. I want 2% or 5% of all profit going to the African community into maybe a, a special slush front, a trust. Maybe that's scholarships for black people. That's independent schools for black people. That's building institutions, hospitals. You need hospitals. You need schools. You need, oh, you see what I'm saying? Nobody's thinking like that. So let me say it one more time. Self, family, African people, community, and then the world. Every time you get some money, that needs to be the formula that you take. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, Dua. <laughs> Shout out to Strawberry1955. Family, yes, please hit the like button, like, share, comment. Uh, we're about to get into this dynamic discussion. Please want to get this out to as many folks as we possibly can. Also want to give a couple of shout outs to my brother, Ron Spears. I see him in the building. Uh, Ron was with us in Kemet last year. Um, definitely going to get a testimonial from Ron. He's one of the great people that have been with us. I um, also see my uh, great sister, Paula Corey, and from Boston. A couple of other folks in the building, Sharon Anderson. So definitely family, like, comment, and share. Get this word out. Get as many folks as we can get into this discussion. Um, Dr. Falou, um, why did you decide to be an economist? What was the inspiration for you? First, the purpose of empowering ourselves, just like he said in the formula, we have to focus precisely in that. How do we empower ourselves? How do we empower our families? How do we empower our communities? And then how do we interact with the world to make sure that that empowerment stick and that that empowerment continue indefinitely forever. 
Now that to do to achieve that is something really very ambitious. But the first thing we need to believe is that we can do it. As you have done very frequently, you have pointed to the fact that happy Africans in Africa many centuries ago started economic development and they did it. And there's no reason why we shouldn't do it. So we feel, and I invite everybody listening to me, to focus in how do I start my project? Maybe you already started a project. Okay, then how do we evaluate to check that that project is producing the resources to empower me, my family, my community, my people, and then how do we interact with the world? We have in business several formulas that are already exist. We have the nonprofit corporation, we have the businesses, but we must focus in which areas are at present developing so we take advantage of the circumstances. For example, real estate, for example, infrastructure right now in the United States is the focus in, is, is in infrastructure because a lot of immigrants are coming and we need development of housing. We need development, redevelopment, and uh, renovation of buildings. Here in New York, for example, there are millions and millions of dollars being prepared for us to take advantage of it in order to secure those contracts that would allow us to get hold of some of those contracts and some of those development, and therefore, the wealth that belong to our community. As it is now, we are mostly consumers. We, our families do not enjoy a proportionate share of the wealth that prevail in our community. He just gave several examples that even black uh, poor people generating millions of dollars, but how much of it trickle to our community? Very little, and in many cases, nothing. So we invite everyone to start planning their own project. What would be your own project? It could be that you take the lead and you are the owner. You could develop a nonprofit institution, and I could go into details of how does that empower you. Or you could develop an enterprise, a business. But the key is which field you, you should choose. What are the circumstances now, fertile and, and good, to make sure that your development get, uh, take place initiated, developed to proportion that will make sure it lasts forever, meaning even when you disappear, when you do your transition, your family inherit and the, the enterprise continue benefiting your family, your community, your uh, people in reality. I, could, I would like to go more into detail in terms of how do you choose your project. Let's take, for example, the nonprofits. Most people call it nonprofit, but that's a misnomer. That's a mistake. It is not a nonprofit. It generates profit. It generates revenue. It generates wealth. How would you say? Why was it called nonprofit? Simply because, in the case of the nonprofit corporation, the owners are uh, committing themselves to service communities not to enrich themselves, then you say, okay, you don't enrich yourself, how do you secure some of the wealth to come to you? Because you could do contracts, secure contracts for yourself, or you could assign yourself salaries. And at this moment, with the unemployment very high in the minorities community, especially the, the black uh, communities, then that's a source of empowerment because you're securing and generating jobs for your communities. And not only you're empowering yourself, but you're empowering families by securing jobs that they could uh, take uh, in this nonprofit. And it's really a double benefit to our communities because not only we are creating jobs for us, but we are developing services that in many cases government is supposed to provide and is, are non-existent. For example, housing, for example, health, for example, the disabled, for example, the seniors, women, children. You name any aspect of our day-to-day -day living, and there is some aspect of it 
that we could develop a nonprofit to service that area. So how do we go about it? I will encourage any of you who say, well, I've been thinking about developing for a long time. Don't think no more. The work to do. Start doing. Taking the first steps necessary. I invite you to call me in any case if you want to do it together, because one of the things we have to do is join forces. There are people with skills, with training, with knowledge, and if you don't have what it takes, then let's join together. We have uh, been lucky or working very hard, and in five years we have helped develop 58 nonprofit corporations. Now that means we have black people as president of their own agencies, of their own institution. We have black people creating jobs for the communities. We have black people uh, preparing budgets where it's a skill that it will be useful for any area of uh, performance that you choose to work. We have black people designing programs and designing programs servicing the black community as a first priority. Why I say this? Because we have colleges and we have institutions that are even in the middle of the black community that are not serving the black community as a priority. I was professor at City College at the Black Studies Department, and many of the decisions being made was not favoring the black community. For example, one case in point, the Black Studies program is not a department. And the repercussions of that type of framework is crucial. Why? Because if you are not a department in a university, your faculty do not reside in your unit, reside in other unit. That means they are in the history department, or they are in the anthropology department, or they are in some other department. Their priority is not servicing the black studies because of when you receive it is like we need to make sure that we understand the entity that we are getting into so that we can work with it intelligently and efficiently in the nonprofit i could come with to any group of yours and um help you uh, with workshop and training and discussion so that you all understand the type of enterprises that you are initiating and you do things that nobody can put a stop to it because you are doing things according to the law, according to the regulations and everything else. Now, you might Thank, Dr. To Falou. So, okay. Dr. Falou, I want to, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I actually want to make a, an announcement um, about some of these these services and and um, you mentioned um, projects and empowerment, and that's just very important. And you also mentioned um, creating jobs and services, and right. and these are things that I, I want people to know. Um, we didn't mention at the top of the show. Just going back to the essence of this discussion and the culture and money um, aspect is we're going to have Infudishi Jahutimes and Dr. Falu going to be on a trip with us in February. And, you know, we're going to be going through the monuments, going through the temples and pyramids. And Fudishi will be um, giving the, 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 the tour, leading the tour. It's some of the, the artwork here um, that we have, the Happy 2024 um, Tour to Egypt, um, Discover the Origins of Economics in Egypt with Happy. Um, you can go ahead to akitours.com right now and register. Um, so amongst many others, that's going to be there with us. We have these two people that's going to be here, these two giants, these two greats. Um, and, and talking about the, the projects, a lot of what Dr. Falou will be, was, was talking about a minute ago about how to formulate your own corporations, your nonprofit, will be workshops, will be economic workshops as we sell up the now. Um, we have our own uh, crews, again, another chartered ship exclusively for our group. I see my brother Lorenzo Small here in the audience. Um, he will be there, him and his, his lovely queen. They'll be a part of this um, extraordinary journey. Um, but it's so very, very important to understand the concept of this trip. If you see here, you're looking into the temple at Abu Simbel, into the um, Ramses II mortuary temple. 
But on, on the foundation there, you see the economics so that people understand that we're dealing with the economics and the culture together. Um, so as we'll be going through our, da our daily um, points of, of interest in terms of the, the various different archeological sites, we'll also be marrying that with information on economics, not just economics of the past and how it got started, but also in the future in terms of where we need to go and how we need to develop our communities. And Dr. Falu will be there along with us as one of the economic uh, presenters, presenters um, on, on the ship. So quickly, Infodishi, we spoke earlier about culture and um, I guess the disconnect. How do we reconnect it? <clears throat> well, first of all, you see, we don't have control of our educational institutions. So it almost kind of starts there. Malefe Asante has put out a concept and he has a book called Afrocentricity. And so you need an African-centered educational system that's going to program people to develop economics for the community and for themselves. So you start there. And even if you, you can re-educate yourself, so if you've been programmed by the matrix and you all of a sudden now your eyes open up and you go, wow, I've just been a puppet. I've just been a puppet for, for white nationalism uh, in blackface. Okay, now you begin to reprogram yourself. We mm -hmm. need to develop all the way from pre-K schools that begin to teach people an African language, African culture, those things that are valuable to African people. Um, African uh, 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 industry, just regular industry of things that we wear, things that we put on. If we take control of that, take an inventory. Uh, you wear sandals or shoes. You have pants, dresses, uh, outfits. You need a bag. You need a tote. You need a wallet. Start taking an inventory of everything you need. You need food. Uh, you need to be able to plant the food. You need to have control of those resources. If you don't have control of the grocery store, then you're enslaved. You have control of your water and your food. You're in bad shape, okay? Now we start to develop the institutions. So that's how we begin to start. So you take, you just start where you are, do an inventory of your community. Everything that we know we need, we need housing. We need to be able to control those institutions. See, sometimes we develop an institution and the building belongs to somebody who has a different economic agenda. Right. And so it's important for us to begin to own those institutions. Right. That, therefore, you're not worried about getting put out when you get too yeah. successful. Or well, you don't have to worry about them doubling the rent. For example, I had a very successful business on 125th Street, uh, right across from Lenox Ave and Malcolm X Boulevard. And they literally double the rent. I remember that. They literally double the rent. So if you're paying 5000 Without anything in between, they went straight to ten thousand to fifteen thousand dollars in one year. Everybody mm -hmm. in my building got out. Even the the grocery man is grocery. I mean, food store, which was making thousands of dollars, couldn't afford that. <laughs> Everybody, and then they re reprogram it, sold it to the city, and and start something new. So we got to control the buildings that we have those institutions right. in. You got a school. You need to control that building that the school is in. Okay. Uh, so see, that's where we're not thinking the way Europeans are thinking. We're right now, people, our culture says that we got to think five and 10 years down the line and don't, and we got to be able to trust each other to go in business with each other. It's ironic that you have an oppressor that has a record of discrimination and exploitation against you, but you trust them more than you trust your <laughs> the average black person who's oppressed with you. So now this person got a track record of shoving his foot up your behind <laughs> and you will go to them for help before you go to your black neighbor or your black friend or a black relative. So the Wooly Lynch syndrome is still part of us. We got to get rid of that. So that's where that educational system. So I start there. Brother Taki, we got to control some farms. So one of the things I'm doing in Ghana is we developing a farm, a hundred acre farm. So we, yes, we want a school, but we want to be able to feed those kids nourishing food. 
And we control that. So the kid learns agriculture. They learn how to plant. They learn how to uh, pick it. Then they learn how to prepare it. That's all part of their educational system. They're learning to be self-sufficient within their own cultural paradigm. Okay, so that's important. You got to keep the money within your cultural paradigm. So you take an inventory. Yes, you need businesses. Yes, you need housing. Yes, you need all these things. But you got to be able to control it. Right. And then you got to set it up so it's passed down to what? The family, (laughs) your people, the community, the nation. You see what I'm saying? So that formula still has to be intact. And so here we are, 2023, and we we don't even represent 2% of the economy (laughs) we're like about almost 20 percent of the population and we are less than three percent of the wealth but we got all these millionaires there's the cultural gap there's the cultural gap we got people on 125th street selling gucci and saying support black business that's not supporting black business that's a black man in business pimping somebody else's stuff and that's not going into, yes, it feeds his family, but it doesn't com- It doesn't uh, feed the community. You walk around with Gucci on your chest and Yves Saint Laurent on your chest. That, <laughs> okay, you see what I'm saying? So I, I need people to realize this, that you got to invest in yourself. And then you push your culture paraphernalia. Everybody does that. And that's how you stay. You're pushing hoppy paraphernalia. Here, I'm wearing the Nubian shirt right here. <laughs> you got a hoppy shirt on. Okay. So we're pushing. I got a, a Nigerian crown on. Okay. I'm pushing an African culture. So people come up to me every day. Whoa, man, can I get a crown like that? You need to be able to provide. I, I'm giving my card here. Go to my website. You can get a crown like that. Okay. You know, boom. You got to perpetuate it. You And you got to. You can't just talk the talk. You got to be able to walk the walk. You got to be a living example of that. So, uh, but the, it, it, that's how fundamental you get. So, just start wherever you're at. What you need, you start right there. You say to yourself, "What do I need in this community? And what can I do? What kind of skill can?" And maybe you don't have it by yourself, but maybe you and two or three other people can accomplish it. We didn't dig this hole by ourselves, <laughs> and you're not going to get out of the hole by ourselves. So we got a lot of people who are the individualists. They just make a lot of money and escape. No, you were probably able to make a lot of money because of what our brothers and sisters and ancestors died so that you could go to that institution, died so that you can get that degree. So nobody gets a degree by themselves. It's a community and a family that got you that. And so now you know an obligation. When I worked at Rutgers University in New Brunswick, next door was Highland Park, which was a very European Jew community. And uh, the rabbi used to give out hundreds of scholarships every year. And every European Jew who got a scholarship had to sign a contract. They had to come back and work in the community five to 10 years after they got their degree. It was mandatory. So much is given, much is respect. We give our scholarships, but that's not attached to it. Mm. <laughs> you know, ASCAT gives out college. We give our scholarships, but that's not attached to it. We need to attach the cultural piece back. So now we give to you. Now you give back. Mm-hmm. Do I? So, you know, I just want to give a quick shout out to... Um, few people in the audience um got my brother uh lorenzo small the cash app for those family definitely want to support the the channel the podcast and ongoing um happy movement um you can definitely do the cash app the super chats the stars um definitely keep the love coming um it's very important for us to kind of to keep the movement alive and keep it moving forward um, so yes, family, definitely want to do that. Shout out to brother Lorenzo Smalls for that. Um, Dr. Falou and Fudishi spoke 
very, very heavily about strategy. Like, how do we, how do we do these things? And it, it's so important when we think about what we need to do, because a lot of the other communities, um, you know, uh, Jewish or Chinese or others, they've been able to take their cultural nationalism and turn that into empowerment very strategically. And it seems like for us in our community, we are struggling with using that type of strategy to get us to that next level of empowerment. In your opinion, what are some of the steps that we can take strategically to get to that level? Well, first of all, each one of the points that he delineated, it is really speaking the truth. That's exactly how it's happening. We need to make sure to focus that we need to identify the fact that we can do it. First of all, we have to trust that we have the skill and if we don't have it, we could find other black people together with us as a team, go forward to secure the opportunity and to develop the project. Of course, we have to recognize that in developing the projects, there are technical areas that we need to find help. And there are many black professionals in accounting, in marketing, in finance, in uh, um, uh, uh, long range planning, in proposal writing, you name it, we can identify them. We just have to make sure to go and look for them. And when we find it, work together. That formula working together cannot be underestimated. We need to use the resources in our community and we need to invest to make sure that there are more black professionals with the different expertise needed to make sure that we are successful in the project we choose. But definitely beside the nonprofit, businesses and enterprise is key. But those businesses and enterprises, we have to match them with the present development. For example, real estate is an area that right at this moment is waiting for us to grab. What he was describing about owning the building is paramount. And that's the first advice I give any group. Buy your own building. They ask me how, the same way they buy. They go to the bank, they borrow the money. Of course, we know that the, some of the uh, inclinations are against us. But if we move the correct steps and we find, as he's mentioning, other blacks that have resources and wealth will be able to secure the mortgages to buy the building. Because if you pay rent, you pay mortgage. In many cases, the rent is even uh, higher than the mortgages to be paid. Of course, moments like the present where the interest are too high, sometimes it's not as easy to be able to sustain the payment of the mortgages. My own institution is going through this problem because we're facing what is called gentrification, which is complicating the reality in many of our communities. We have to get together to make sure that we uh, make sure it doesn't happen and to prevent from happening because specifically we're going through cases where we own the buildings and they are doing all kinds of things, including illegal steps to take over our buildings because then they turn it into these big centers where they uh, assign rents that we cannot afford. And that's what gentrification means. We kick out of our communities and the cultural cohesiveness that we were living in our communities get, get, go out of the window because we can't, we're not there together anymore. And most of the time we cannot fight back. But I have news for you. We can fight back. If we get together, if we make a plan, if we make a budget, if we uh, push the buttons of assistance of programs that exist throughout the economy, throughout the financial world, our own people, our own community, it can be done. Now, in terms of real estate and, and some of the gentrification issues that I was discussing, the first thing I assured was to own a building because it's what as he was describing you want to secure your location so that the future of your enterprise is secure and you just have to focus in developing the marketing the, the products that you're going to uh, sell and, uh, and the planning the financial planning 
we need we comment. have a deficit in terms of skills. I want to comment. We must recognize that. So we have to make sure to secure that those scholarships go to areas where we need our people prepared. Finances, accounting, architecture, construction. Those are areas that we need people trained to be able to push forward some of our projects. Can I make a comment on that? Yes, go ahead, Infodigi. Okay. Here's a perfect example. See, we got some powerful institutions in place, but those institutions did not take this formula. Money plus culture equals power. I'm going to give you a perfect example. I'm a founding member of ASCAT. I remember the second, the third year of ASCAT when we were in New York, ASCAT made money for the first time, hundreds of thousand dollars. The next year we went to Egypt and gave all our money to the Arabs and I haven't had no money since. I came to the, I came to them in 1987 and I says, right in 1987, we had all these abandoned buildings in Harlem. Right. And there was these abandoned buildings around City College. Mm, I yes. remember coming to them and saying, we need to take some of that money and buy some of these buildings. Mm. We got all the it, we have all the skills that we need. We have professors in every skill. That's mm. right. So we don't have to go out. We can reconstruct the building ourselves and make it. And now we can say, okay, this is the Eastern Regions building. Then we can do the same thing in the, the central. We can do the same thing in, in the West. And so that ASCAT has institutions. I remember I was doing an economic program and it was talking about McDonald's. And it said that McDonald's number one thing is is there is real estate. You when you think of McDonald's, you think of burgers. No, real estate. They own those buildings that they're in. The yes, economics. Right. So right. McDonald's is this multi conglomerate real estate company. We don't understand. So what we do? We got this powerful institution. I don't want to just jump on ASCAT. That was just one example. But we got powerful institutions like that, and. We got to, we go to college campus, to college campus, and and, and beg for space, and, and and hope we can get it, and and we empower them instead of empowering ourselves. You see, that's institution building. Definitely, ASCAT that's should have this umbrella of institutions in each one of the. So when we give our conference, we ain't got to go begging somebody for their space. Right. They, we build the space. Hey. Yes, definitely. You see, that's yes. a different thinking mentality. That's right. You gotta own the space. When the New York Giants know they got a franchise, they go build a stadium first. They build a stadium, and now they they can house a hundred thousand people. Each of those football teams understand this formula, so their culture is football. <laughs> their culture is football. They got a fan base, but they realize they need to own the real estate. So the first thing they do is they go and invest. They get investors and they build a stadium. How come we're not thinking like that? Mm. We're in African studies. We're in we're in all the colleges, but we ain't got no institutions for African studies in the community. <laughs> so, definitely, definitely, the focus that he's describing is right on target. And I invite everyone: if you want to take a first step. I have right now a business, a, a, a case of a building that I need partners to buy the building. I will work with them to buy those buildings because the purpose of those buildings was to secure what he last mentioned, an Africana Studies University. There's not a single university with that single mission in the whole world, including Africa. Okay, so that's one of the purposes of this developing, developing a center of 12th floor with the university in the first four floor. That's a plan we have. I invite those people who are listening to us to call us. And even if you are not own it, but you could invest a portion and we could go together to develop the planning and the money necessary to make sure that this project gets completed. Definitely so. Papa, you've been, into our, you've been into our little black museum, right? The Genesis Museum there. The first thing that I was doing as we was beginning to develop that to the next level, I said, do we own the building? Yes, we own the building. Okay, that's the first step you got to talk about. Now, we move on and we do other things. But now, you know, we need a bigger space. We need, but that's that's a key. 
It's the yeah, key. Right. We gotta start. We're yeah. not thinking there. Right. And Fudishi, let me let me let's go back for a second because you you touched what you touched on what happened in the 80s is essentially reason why one we <clears throat> put this journey together, this trip together. I hate to call it a trip, this pilgrimage to 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 Kemet to Egypt together the way that we did in terms of marrying our culture with our economics. Mm -hmm. Because often to time, and I and the way I, I like to call it as we, I think in the community, for us, culture is the low-hanging fruit. Is very easily obtainable. We can put on dashikis. We can wear crowns. We can walk around with unks. You know, we can read books. Like you know, these things are kind of easy. But the economics and the politics is somewhat further away from us, and it seems like it's much harder for us to get and obtain. But we have a situation like that, and you have the greatest minds in the organization. Like, what is the disconnect? Because I'm I'm having a hard time understanding. You know, and I'm not to mention some of the greats that were ASCAC. And just so people understand what ASCAC is, we're going to explain that in a second. But why is it so difficult when you have this that level of intellect there? Because as as Dr. Flu has led to, is that we're not educated about economics. So even if we have this dynamic cultural persona, it's not connected to economics because that wasn't part of our family growing up. That yeah. wasn't like you know in kindergarten. Your, your, your parents took out a 401k for you. You know, <laughs> uh, you got a trust fund by the time you went to high school. Uh, you, don't, those things are not part of our paradigm. Experience, we have right. to begin to make it that. We got to begin exactly. to make it that, Hoppy. Exactly. And, and so, but we got to create those institutions. See, once you know what's missing, now you go back and you put it together. See, other than that, you can just plead ignorance. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. No. Well, if you're watching this program, now you know. <laughs> you know we got to be able to control the institution. All right, so here's an example. Okay, so your culture is feeding into the economics. So uh, we are the builders of ancient Kemet. That's part of our culture. So we're going to develop a tour guide, a trip that goes there, and we're going to empower Black people. We're going to pay back people to, to guide, to be guides. We're going to play back people to, to help us. And we're going to benefit from that. And then we're going to take products that's geared around that. See, so you're starting to live that. Your products is part of the culture. The culture is creating economics. And we're feeding our culture and it becomes circular. It becomes circular. Well, we got to do that same thing in the community. Right. When you talk about that the Hispanic uh, uh, type of community, they feed their culture back around and around. The Chinese community, They, when I was little, I took my son to Chinatown. So he said, yeah, okay. Then we went to Little Italy, right? You know, then, so he said, Dad, where's Little Africa? <laughs> I took him to Harlem and people was nodding out, you know? <laughs> okay, so we don't have control of that. So we got to, I mean, it's not like I, I just made up something. Other people are using this paradigm like you talked about. But you see, they are programmed. They never went through the Holocaust that we went through. So they didn't, they didn't need to develop institutions to reprogram them. We went through a Ma'anga Mizi, a tremendous Holocaust. We got deprogrammed. Dr. Clark said they laughed at our names, we changed them. They laughed at our clothes, we changed them. They laughed at our spiritual system, we changed it. We need to stop laughing <laughs> and get busy and redeveloping all those things. But they took our tongue from us. They took our culture from us. We got to pull that back. And we need to pull that back, the sense that we can own. Because for yeah. example, even in Harlem, we are not the majority of the owners of those enterprises there. And the children, our children, don't see the experience of our family being the owners. And the children learn from what they see. So we need to work harder at getting our children to understand that they can own. One of the main problems I have had with the 58 Corporation Organized is to convince these people, you are the president, you are the owner, you're the one in charge, you're the one to command, you're the one who makes the decisions. It's not in their side because somebody else was making the decision. And the society, being that the white is the one who prevails, wanted to make sure to remain it like that. 
where we don't learn to be in charge, where we don't learn to be in control, where we don't learn to own. We need to work at that harder. Here's another problem. We can look at it, we can attack the problem a different way, Chucky. Let's just say, okay, what are obstacles? What are the obstacles? Okay, it's all it's all nice to say what we need to do. Let's just say, what are the obstacles that we face? We say individually we don't have no money, but we know collectively we have money. Right. Individually, mm -hmm. we don't control educational institutions. So I want you to watch this. Obstacles that we're up against. Most of our women are in the church. That's a problem. Number two, most of our men are in jail. That's a problem. <laughs> and they got all of our children in their educational institutes. Right. So they, they're messing up our children's mind. So that by the time they're in high school or whatever, they already, it's a wrap almost. Only about 5% of them are going to be successful in terms of being able to be used for African people. 5%. That's not a good, that's not good statistics. But that's what they've developed. So they got all of our children. So we haven't taken control. We're the only people that send our children to our oppressor. Hmm. The European Jews got the city paying for their educational institutions. Do you realize that? You're, hmm. the, 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 the city pays for private Jewish institutions. And when they had those Jewish institutions take a test, after two tests on what you're supposed to know, they all fail. But they knew Jewish history and Jewish culture, and they're circulating that Jewish dollar. <laughs> and they okay. own those things. And they're not bigger nobody, and they own them buildings, and they control whole communities. And that's what okay. we need to so do. You see, they took control of their educational system and made the city pay for it. They Housing. Do you realize, I think, uh, what is it? Uh, is it, I don't know if it's HUD. Um, uh, the housing program where you get the vouchers and stuff like that. What is that called? Uh, section eight. Section eight. European yeah. Jews are the number one people in section eight. Mm. <clears throat> so they realize that they cornered that market. So if they don't own it, they, they get almost free rent. <laughs> That's a sweet deal. That allows you to develop some economics. <laughs> mm. You spend almost all your money. They got they got laws. Watch this, Taki. If you you have to go to the synagogue within walking distance of where you live, you shouldn't have to take a bus or drive. You got to walk to. And within that within walking distance, that synagogue has to be your your food, your a supermarket, your food, your clothing, and all that has to be within walking distance. So that means that they seize their community. And now these are laws that they pass. This is just something you got to do if you're going to be part of the Hebrew community. And guess guess where they got those ideas from? Us. <laughs> and, we, and, we, <laughs> and and you know and and that's why, you know, we we put this together the way we did. Felicia, please put that the uh, the meme back up. You know, one of the things when we talk about just thinking of again us being economic actors, we have to understand that we may see economics as distant from us, but we were the first people to develop this. Yes. You know, the pyramids, the tombs, the, the temples, all those things, this great culture we speak of, it took a considerable amount of economic know-how to do it. And we did it before, we could do it again. Like you said, they got it from us. So we want to just kind of segue into this um, quickly and um, kind of talk about this. You've, you, you know, you've been on um, several of the journeys with us. Um, what in your in, in your opinion what is your uh takeaway not necessarily takeaway but your thoughts on the program that's combining economics with our culture for I for this for this upcoming journey awesome. go back to that picture show back that picture go back to that picture again just back up show the uh Abba Simba one more time all right that's gonna come up in a second but okay. as that's coming up family so please like comment share um, for those that I sign up for the newsletter, definitely want to sign up for your newsletter um, for the happy newsletter, happyfilm.com. We have some exciting announcements coming up. Um, again, we're going to be in Atlanta um, the end of next month. Um, and we're going to be doing some other projects coming up really soon. So to stay connected, definitely want to get in tune with that. Also, again, thank you, my brother, Lorenzo Small. He's always very generous and showing his love. People definitely want to, uh, you know, contribute, help out with the happy movement. 
I'm happy. Um, there is the bottom of the screen. Also, super chats and stars. Um, go ahead, Infadishi. It's up now. So we look at this building, and all of us go, ooh, ooh, and we take pictures. And we have no idea that economics that went into this. First of all, they employed the best artisans. You had to and you had to bring in the best architects. You had to bring in your scribes because there's writing every place on the wall. The whole community was in God. You had to feed these people. So the farmers were all employed. So you had to feed these people. They had rations. I had to take care of their families. So if you'll see, there was housing developments around this. So they built a housing development around this project. So I housed the people, I fed the people, and I paid them. And I and I, I embraced the whole community. I had my artisans, I had my artists, I had my spiritual workers. The scientists had to make sure that the sun went straight through the center of this door and hit right. the holy, holies, you know, at this certain particular time. So I had to have my engineers, my scientists, every facet of the community was employed and everybody got paid. And we did it to last for eternity. Now I know we're probably not thinking about eternity today, but at least for our lifetime, okay, we need to begin to employ like this. So as we begin to build, we need to look into the community and we food, water, shelter, clothing, get our artists, get the babies, get the children, get everybody involved in the, so this is a true example of money plus culture plus economics equals power. Yes, yes, yes. And, and family, I just want to just add on to that um, quickly. Um, you know, when we think of ancient Kevin, he's building these several projects, a lot of times communities were formed around them to be able to cultivate and, and develop them and erect them in, in a certain way. And we think of labor strikes that we know of today, rather than these unions going strike, we don't feel like they're getting paid enough. The first recorded labor strike in history took place in ancient Kemet. And these are some of the things we're going to be discussing as we're going through the trip to understand that we were the first people to really develop economics, not just in a cliche type way, or we just saying it, you know, um, just because it sounds good, but this is a fact. These are recorded right. documents speaks to these types of things. So when Infodishi was just talking about, about they were paying the people, that is correct. And when people felt like they didn't get paid enough, they was like, we're not working. So <laughs> it tells us two things, that they were getting paid, number one, and two, that it was not slave labor, because slaves don't strike. So that dispels any of the other notions out there about these mythologies we have surrounding ancient Kemet. So Dr. Falu, we know you went to Kemet, um, you traveled several times, particularly with Dr. Ben. What right. were those experiences like for you? They were magnificent because it brought us face to face with the reality that our people from since ancient times were developing their own project, were developing their own culture, their own uh, sciences, their own mathematics, their own uh, theology, their own history. Almost every field of knowledge we learned that was being developed there before even Europe existed, which most people don't understand that situation. How could now be assigned to uh, Greece many of the development of this field when this uh, end, uh, state weren't in existence, when we were 2,000 years before Christ already producing, developing the different fields of knowledge the different fields of producing products, architecture, construction. So we need to focus on that. And if the school don't teach our children, we have the responsibility of our family to do it. We need to produce materials so our children read in the families, in the club, in the group, any way possible. So our children learn from the very beginning that we were doing it before any other culture was doing it. And that our culture together with the empowerment of the economic development, develop this great um, um, production that still are present. When I went there and I saw, for example, the, the paintings at the top of some of these temples, then I recognized that what I saw in Italy was just a copy of what Egyptian, Black Egyptians were doing centuries before Christ. And in every field of knowledge, 
for example, theology, the, the, if you look the book number three of, of the Bible, the, you, you can see that this work, what Moses was dictating to them when they were crossing the desert, but Moses was raised with the, with the black, with the Pharaoh. That's where he learned all of that. So the, 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 the confrontation that even Christianity in the African religion understand that. But that's a case that we see when we go to Egypt and leave those experiences face to face. And I could go on and on. When I was teaching at, at, at City College Black Study, I brought most of the uh, information and many of the students, the professors, to us. I said, well, the, the institution has made sure that this is not known, this is in purpose, and it is our responsibility to bring it, to write it, to document it, and to teach it. Definitely. Uh, Thank you. So, Taki, when we, in sep September, we'll be pushing a big campaign to get people, for example, everybody that's going on the trip, again, to take the Madhu Netcha class. Okay. That's so okay. now, again, we the circle. So now you're getting a foundation. You're saying, well, okay, Infodisi, how do I get this African-centered knowledge and information? And so... You see, what the Europeans did, they took our formula and they're using it. So they took, but only they took our culture. They hijacked that. There's almost not a prominent museum in the world without an ancient Egyptian and African wing to it. That right. brings millions of peoples every year. And that money doesn't go to the black community. Hmm. Okay. You see that? So, you know, we have to begin to do that. So you say, okay, well, it's not in our educational system. We don't know how to speak but do nature only because you didn't try. Okay, so what we try to do, we offer this Madhu Netcha class so that when you come, you come empowered. Now you can take that and open up your own institutions. I got one of my school uh, students who's teaching the Madhu Netcha in her daycare and her, mm. her kindergarten. She got little kindergartens, no more Madhu Netcha than half the people I know. Okay, <laughs> uh, so you identify all the Netcha rule and everything. So now these are our art historians, our scientists of tomorrow. So I'm offering this Madhu Netcha class to help empower people. So let's 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 put this in context. And I'm going to use something Dr. Falou said a second ago to, to open this up. Teaching the children. Um, first thing is, these our journeys are kid-friendly. People ask all the time, can they bring their children? And I always strongly encourage people to bring their children. I ran into this young man at the International African Arts Festival. And he came to Egypt with us about 20 years ago. He was a little boy, like five, six years old. I didn't even recognize him. And he was just talking about his experience and how much that influenced his life and how much of an impact it had. And he was five, he was about six at the time. And we never know what these experiences will do to young people. So I encourage those who have young children and who are kind of considering it or maybe on the fence about it to definitely um, just, just go ahead and bring their children um, along with you. Um, the Infudishi spoke a second ago about the metal nature class. It's so critically important um, whenever we're going to Kemet that we have a foundation to build on that right. we're reading we're reading we're studying we're studying the language he's speaking about the meta nature the language of of the ancient kemet and i'll let him get into that in, in a second but it's really important that we we have that as a as a foundation piece um it's also Im important that we also say that we are honored to have infodishi jutimes on the trip with us to be with one of the guides uh, along with several others and we're going to be honored also to have dr flu on the trip with us to be a part of the economic equation and how do we solve some of these things because it's so critically important. And just to kind of go briefly through the, um, the program, we call it the happy tour because a lot of it's going to mir mirror some of the places in the film that in, in the happy film that we, um, we're going to visit the places that were shot in the film, that are probably displayed in the film, excuse me. And as we're doing that, we're also going along talking about the economics, not only the past, but also the present how we get to the future, which is so critically important. Everything we do in Hoppy is solution-based. We're not just want to talk about things, we're solution-based and we're going to keep going on with that, with that program. Um, so this, this journey um, also has a four-day cruise up the Nile from Luxor to Aswan. And on that ship, it's a charted cruise exclusively for our group. We're going to have several activities. We're going to have live musical performances. Um, we're going to make those announcements shortly. Um, we're also going to have the linen party. We're also going to have our economic workshops and other activities that's going to go along with the program 
um, of the itinerary of the pyramids, temples, and tombs. So it's going to be a very comprehensive experience, and we encourage all those, everyone to come along and be a part of this. Um, so, Dr. Flew, I'm sorry, you were going to say something earlier. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that we coordinate the spe possible specific projects that the people who want to participate might bring in their mind so that we forward and continue helping them to push to progress into all the different stages of those projects. If they bring ideas already in the workshops, we'll make sure that we put together ideas that share common characteristics so that we push the progress of those projects to the point that when they return, they, it, they, it's just arriving and, and go, go on with the next steps to make it a reality. I invite everybody to start thinking of specific projects, specific, uh, whether it's a real estate, whether it's construction, whether it's whatever it is they choose, and, and bring it, bring the ideas so that we could help them advance and call me. Uh, my telephone should be somewhere in, 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 the, in this program at any time. Please, please call me at any time to help you uh, developing the, the, the plan so that we continue throughout the trip and when we return, then make it a reality. Yes. With Dr. Falou speaking about the economic workshops that's going to take take place along the trip um, and particularly on the cruise. Also, very, so very important, the Happy Dinner Gala. The trip will culminate with the Happy Dinner Gala. Please bring your breast attire. Um, we're going to have a beautiful experience on the culmination of, of this uh, this journey. And it's going to be um, very powerful. It's going to be um, a lot of information shared there. And we're going to have opportunity just to commune with the family and figure out ways that we can just work together. So now, Infodishi, I'm sorry, you were talking a minute ago about the Metalurgy class. And I really want to kind of put this in perspective so people can understand that the class is a precursor to segue them into this exciting journey in February. Yes. And those people who have taken it, it's a master class one and a two. So if you've had one, uh, cause we had some people who went on the trips who really matriculated and did dynamic, uh, before we went to the last trip, they can take Madhu Nature too. So it's a master class. So it's not just a beginner class. Uh, the class is geared around the culture and specifically to the, the places that we're going to. So not only are you learning the general culture of ancient Kemet, you're being specific. So you'll have greater knowledge of the temples that you do enter and you'll not be able to just take my word for it or the guide, you'll be able to go to the walls and say, okay, there's the king's name right here. How come they keep calling him Ramses II? It says Ursa Ma'at Ra, Setepin Ra. <laughs> okay, so we'll be able to break that down for you, you know, and then you go empowered and you bring this back and you give it to your family and you study it. And you, and if you're an educator, you begin to implement this in your educational program. Remember, okay. Our former oppressor has control of all of our children. And then you wonder why you are, you're not doing for yourself. You're not right. supposed to. Mm. You're not, I need to say this. I'm sorry, Taki. You're supposed to be messed up. <laughs> you're supposed to be at the situation that you're in right now. It's up to you to break out of this paradigm of that expectation. It's in your hand. You don't have to stay there. Nobody has chains on your arms now. The chains is just on your mind. But you can take the chains off your mind by empowering and educating yourself, reading the necessary books, going on the trips, being around people who are trying to be progressive. Okay? So you want to if you're the smartest person in your group and you're not doing so good, you you're in the wrong group. <laughs> okay? So get out of that group and, and expand yourself. Learn your language. Remember, Dr. Clark said they laughed at our language and they took it from us. You take it back. Begin to build your own institutions. Take yes. control of your culture. Expose yourself. I'm glad Taki talked about it. When I take people on museum trips, I'm always seeing all these children of everybody else except for our people. We leave our children home with the babysitter. But you go get culture. No Bring them children with you. Even if you think they don't understand everything that's going on, they do. They're getting stuff. They're being exposed. 
They're in an atmosphere of education. Right. And so expose them to the museums. Take them to on trips. Take them to the countryside. Show them nature. Take them to the zoo. Keep them. Take them on your vacation with you. Show them. Expose them. So how do they register for the uh, class? Because that's the important thing. Yes. Um, right now, we're still in the middle of a class right now. So this class ends at the end of July and it ends in the uh, beginning of August. So September is when we'll be really be pushed at the end of August and September. We'll push out a, a special big program for them to register for the class. And so they can register one and two, master class one or master class two. Those who already know something. Uh, but uh, it's very comprehensive. We got a new map that we just p- uh, produced. Uh, you know, that, that shows the, the demographics of ancient Kemet, the real names of the cities and stuff like that, that can be purchased and a whole bunch of things like that. So at the end of uh, July, August, in August, all of that will start coming together. So this September, it'll be flying. Class is starting in October. Okay. And okay. then they can get their certificate on the boat in the Nile, floating down the Nile. <laughs> okay. So listen. So so those who are in the class will. Act with, so we just if we just gave us a, some activities um, as we are selling up the Nile from Luxor Swan. We're gonna have a graduation ceremony where people will get their certificates um, to graduating from the Meta Nature class, and that's a what, what more appropriate location and place for, to have that happen. Uh, shout out to my sister Paula. For her cash app love much love to my sister paula for that um so yeah that's going to be an exciting experience those people who are going to be in this um in this class will have the opportunity not only to be a part of the class and this great experience and i can attest personally how fantastic these metametric classes are in fudishi i've been in the class several times um and that kind of opened me up to learning how to as i go to egypt and in understanding what i'm looking at and Definitely this is something I always encourage people to, to be a part of. Um, so definitely you want to make sure we keep this going. Um, yeah, so we have about seven months. Please just put up the the um, information in regards to um, the, the, the the journey, the kibbit, and how you can go ahead and take care of this. Go to akedtours.com. Um, from now to February, about seven months to go ahead and just figure out a way how to formulate payment plans so that we can go ahead and just make this happen. Anybody got any questions, definitely email me all day, happyfilm.com, happyfilm at gmail.com, excuse me, any questions about the the journey to Kemet. All right, so Dr. Philo, you got any closing words, anything you would like to add? I encourage everyone to get ready to start your own uh, project, your own development, your own empowerment goals, and join us to make sure the culture and uh, economic uh, empower us. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Um, yes, your culture is your medicine. Most of us are upside down, inside out, and backwards. If you're upside down, inside out, and backwards, even if we give you some good information, you can't do nothing with it because your spatial perspective, your cultural paradigm is all jacked up. So learn your culture, your history, so that you can take control and be the captain of your ship. Hopefully, I'll see you in the Madhu Netcha classes. And hopefully, we'll all be together cruising down the Nile, being glowing with the knowledge of our ancestors. So just just quickly before we let you go, when does the new class start? Uh, The class starts 1st of October. 1st of October. So that means we want to have... We got yeah. to have you here. October, November, uh, December, and it ends in January. So it'll be fresh when they go in February. <laughs> <laughs> so we, I mean, we also got to have you come back so we can yeah. talk about the so class. Class, yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So we definitely, so you said in October, so maybe sometime in, sometime in September, we're going to revisit this conversation and have you, have you come back so we can get people to eat and, uh, sign up for this uh, Metanetra class. Right. All right, family. So listen, I want to thank you guys. I appreciate it um, for coming on the platform. Like I said, we're honored to have you on this upcoming journey with us on the Nile. We look forward to being with you on the on the happy and in about this this happy experience of us working together. Um, when we think of the, the the understanding of the principle of happy, the the tying of the lotus and the papyrus plants 
strengthening the kingdom, working together. That unity, what we call power and unity, is the basis for Kemet, is the basis for who we are, is the basis for our civilization, is the basis for our community. We have to have that type of unity. We have to go back to that. And that's what we need with it happy is unity. So family, again, want to thank these two um, great scholars for being here. Um, and we definitely look forward to having them again in, in the future. All right. Do our next. Peace. All right, family. Listen, we've had, we've been doing trips um, to the now for almost about 25 years. Uh, you know, and Fredici mentioned something a minute ago about not seeing yourself represented. And that for me was the inspiration back in 1999 when I visited Kemet for the first time. I didn't see any non-indigenous black people. So it made me concerned that everyone from all around the world was marveling over our civilization, but we just didn't have any interest in it. So that motivated me to want to start to do these, 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 these tours, these trips, these pilgrimages to the now. And since then, we've been doing it since 1999. And I have to say that this is one that I'm really, really excited about. Going to Egypt now, countless times, I don't even count anymore, how many times I've been there, but I'm really excited about February because this is, I give us an opportunity to be in a space and do what we really need to do because having all this information without applying it practically, it's a waste. We can't know all these different things and, and we're not doing anything with this. So if we're not really in trying to figure out ways to empower ourselves, what is the point? And I'm a type of person, I don't like wasting my time. So the point here for us is empowerment. So we have money and culture equals power. And that is the theme that we're going with. That is the theme of Happy. That is the theme Happy has always been about in this upcoming tour in February discover the origins of economics in Egypt with Hopi. You have to be a part of this. This is essential. So we're going to definitely close with that image, but I also want to uh, reiterate um, that we have a clearance sale on all the merchandise to make way for new inventory. So you can get your Happy merch at happyfilm.com. For those who are not currently signed up for the newsletter, please do so. Um, we have an announcement, um, so we mentioned it earlier about the happy appearance in Atlanta, end of next month at the National Business League Conference. Um, so that's going to be in a powerful event and we encourage people who are in that area to come be a part of that with us. So family, I just want to say thank you for everyone that's attended, um, the, the, the program tonight, please again, comment, like, and share, and, uh, we look forward to seeing you soon in the future. Peace. I don't know what we can talk about in this nation without talking about white superiority, honestly. Who defines the meaning of God also defines the relationship between economy and God. African Americans spent $1.3 trillion last year, making us the 16th wealthiest nation in the world. Why have we not turned those riches into wealth to develop our community?